1154, they go to England immediately. They are going to claim the throne. They both understand exactly what this implies, that they have now pieced together her southern territory, as you see on the map, his northern section. Brittany would, uh, will also be included in their territory eventually. It'll pass to one of his children, uh, and then England itself. So they were looking in 1154 at one of the greatest empires in the world, and it certainly changes Europe uh, dramatically for the next 100 years. Uh, it isn't permanent, as you know, by virtue of knowing what the map of France looks like, but it's very important. Um, it lasts a long time, and she and Henry have an impact on every single person uh, in their circle, including 10 children. So, so that is a lot of children. As you can see, Henry was not in the chapel praying very much at all. In fact, he rarely took time off to go offer a prayer. Uh, here's a nice picture of them together. This is Henry and Eleanor. Of course, this isn't a photograph of them. This is an imagination of the two. Uh, it does give you a sense of her as very beautiful, and we have a lot of uh, testimony from people who lived at the time, including poets and writers who knew her very well, and we'll meet one of them next week, who wrote things about her, and the most extensive and detailed are comments by the great poet uh, from uh, Poitiers named Bernard de Ventadorn, and Bernard uh, adored her, was one of her best friends, and wrote some of the most beautiful poetry of uh, the 12th century. And, it, and, and his writings include comments on Eleanor as very beautiful, uh, very, very intelligent, very, very elegant, uh, and uh, very cultured. She was. Uh, probably she was the best educated, the most widely traveled woman of her time. Uh, she had come out of a family that gave education to their to their children, including the girls, so she was a part of that. And then her time in Paris was also a time when she was very active intellectually, uh, knew what was happening you know, with the studies that were going on at the cathedral, knew what was happening in the arts. And so now she's in England, in London, and that adds more knowledge and more understanding uh, of English stories, of English mythology, of English history, all of those things are now added to her. So she's a very, very impressive woman, uh, tenacious, strong, um, uh, wily and cunning, and uh, able to maneuver with the best of them, including her husband, who was, uh, who was a maneuverer by all means. And so for, I've written up here, for about a decade, they are great partners. For about 10 years from the time Henry becomes king uh, to about a 10-year period, the two of them are in complete agreement on what they're doing. Uh, they both understand they need a family. They need, they need children who can take over. Uh, she had a huge piece of real estate. He had in France, and now they have England. So they were all imagining that the various sons would take over. The daughters would marry uh, kings, and that's exactly what they did. One of them becomes Queen of Spain, one of them becomes P Queen of Sicily, one of them becomes the Holy Roman Empress. So uh, th all their children uh, became extraordinary. So for about 10 years, it's a very successful marriage. She's older uh, by, I think it's eight years. Uh, he's 21 when they marry and then uh, for the next 10 years. But uh, uh, she appreciated him. Uh, he loved her. He saw her as as adding to his luster. She was probably the most famous woman in the world at the time. And so he was uh, delighted to share uh, in the leadership with her. He involved her in things and um, making children. Now, here's a list. Uh, the two at the top of the list were children that she produced with the King of France, with Louis. So Marie, who became the Countess of Champagne and one of the most important women in Europe, and uh, Alice, the Countess of Blois, these two women married the two greatest dukes they could have married, two greatest counts in France. The one that was the Count of Champagne, the one the Count of Blois. So one in the east of Paris, one in the west of Paris. Then the other children, there were ten children, they're not all listed here because they didn't all live uh, to adulthood, but there's William, who became Count of Poitiers, there's Henry, who was to be the next king 
of England. There was Matilda, who marries the Duke of Saxony. There's Richard I, becomes the King of England. Geoffrey becomes the Duke of Brittany. Eleanor becomes the Queen of Castile. Joan becomes the Queen of Sicily. And then the last uh, of their children is John, who becomes King of England. So all of their children became uh, leaders, and they're all contemporaries of each other. So, so all of these people know each other and see each other frequently in the various international uh, get-togethers get at Paris and other places. So Marie is important in some of the uh, Crusades, and Alice is important in some of the meetings that take place in the in the Loire Valley. So all these people know each other. S they're all uh, brothers and sisters and stepbrothers and stepsisters. So this is the incredible family that they create. Not only, of course, is it impressive at the time, but it was going to impact all of the rest of Europe. And, of course, all of these children would go to the continent as the time evolved in and, and, and become leaders in their territory in the various parts of Europe and in the Anjouan Empire. So as we just saw, Geoffrey becomes Duke of Brittany, uh, one uh, becomes the Duke of Poitiers, and as the years go by, they uh, begin to uh, lead Europe. And so from 1150 to 1200, uh, most of Europe has something to do with Eleanor and Henry. So for 10 years, I say, uh, they did extremely well and were a brilliant team, uh, both raising their family, uh, educating their family, uh, patronizing the arts, building, uh, patronizing histories and books and poetry and all the rest. Then, I think it's fair to pick the year 1164 as a turn of their fortunes. And the issue that changes things for Henry, for her husband, is Thomas Becket. And you see him there with Henry, with Henry and Thomas, and they are working together, and they are dining together. Uh, they were great friends. In fact, Thomas Becket was Henry's best friend. Uh, they adored each other. They were similar age, similar uh, brilliance and genius. And so for a while, Becket was his chancellor, that is, his number one uh, government leader. And then, as many of you know, um, the Archbishop of Canterbury died. And this was the most important religious leader in the whole country. And Henry got the bad idea to nominate his best friend, who was a secular man and really had no reason that he should be in the church. Um, but we, Henry, of course, could arrange for him to be run through quick, you know, run through the seminary and be ordained and all the rest of it. And, become Archbishop of Canterbury. And so um, Henry insisted, 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 uh, pressured uh, Beckett to take the job, and finally Beckett broke down. Here's pictures of their friendship there on the left side in the person of Peter O'Toole and Richard Burton, because most of you know that this friendship and this story is all uh, told in the brilliant uh, movie Beckett. Best historical story ever put on film. There's just nothing better. Uh, it's accurate in every detail, and the two men were perfect. They were just brilliant choices, O'Toole and Burton. And so the movie of it uh, gives you one of the best uh, visions of uh, Henry II and uh, Beckett. But in the choice that he made uh, to nominate uh, Beckett, uh, he made a terrible mistake because Beckett became independent and went on his own way and enraged Henry, because Henry had been expecting a pliant, cooperative Archbishop of Canterbury, and instead Thomas had become an independent leader of the church. And so in a moment of rage, uh, Henry screamed out, won't someone relieve me of this pestiferous priest? A little alliterative poetry there. And three of the men in the court right then at that moment overhearing Henry, got on their horses, rode to Canterbury, and murdered Thomas Becket at the foot of the altar, spattering his brains and blood all over the floor of the cathedral and leaving him laying at the foot of the altar dying. Uh, the event was so shocking, so completely beyond anything that anybody would have ever allowed or ordered or wanted to happen, that the entire 
European world exploded in rage at Henry. Uh, he was blamed. He, he, of course, immediately said he didn't want this to happen, and, and I'm sure he didn't. But he was blamed, and therefore the uh, church in Rome came down on him. The king of France, everyone else uh, came down upon him. And so he had absolutely no choice but to do exactly what the religious authorities asked him to do because he was facing uh, an interdict. He could, uh, he could have his whole country cut off from the, from the Christian church. So he agreed uh, to uh, go on his knees uh, in light clothing uh, to the front doors of Canterbury. And it's brilliantly played in the movie because O'Toole just does this, goes on his hands and knees to the foot of the front of the church and then goes inside and is whipped uh, in, the, uh, in the undercroft of the church by a, by a priest. And there's a picture of Henry being uh, punished uh, with the tomb of Beckett next door. Uh, and it w it's, it's the most famous incident like that in all of, the, uh, of all of Europe. And it also tells you that uh, the power of Rome was great. The power of, of Rome is very great in 1164 in Europe. Kings simply cannot allow themselves to be put outside of the church. If they, if they do, if they get put away, if, they get, if an interdict is put on their country, you can't get married, you can't have burials, you can't have priests do anything. Your whole country just stops uh, in terms of religious services, and, and no king could allow that. So, 1164 is a change, a dramatic change in Henry's fortunes and in running England and in the success that he's experiencing and certainly in the partnership with, with uh, Eleanor because Eleanor... Um, is as critical of what happened as anybody. And so not only does he lose his best friend in the death of Beckett, but he's also becoming estranged from his wife, who is also critical. So uh, correctly, quite correctly. Uh, Henry's rage was horrible to behold. And everyone in his family knew it, and everybody had seen it. And so the result is that coming out of the crisis of Beckett, uh, uh, Hen Henry and Eleanor are estranged, and here you see the other great film that's been made about Henry and Eleanor, and that is uh, Lion in Winter. Now, the Lion in Winter, for me, Eleanor of Aquitaine is Catherine Hepburn. You know, I mean, that I just I could just see her. You know, that she's 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 uh, Eleanor. And uh, in the film, in the Lion in Winter, it tells about the period of this estrangement. Uh, when, they're, when they're basically enemies. And the trouble between them increases because of uh, another person in his life, a fair young Rosamond, a beautiful young woman, Rosamond Clifford, with whom Henry falls in love. Uh, and now this makes things worse for him at home. Um, you're all going to say, wait a minute, wait a minute, this is a queen. She's been all over the world. Is she really surprised if her husband uh, plays around a little bit? No, no, no. She wasn't surprised. Uh, all kings played around. Kings thought they could do what they wanted to do. But they were supposed to be discreet about it. And they were certainly supposed to be discreet if their wife was Eleanor of Aquitaine, uh, where he could pick up, she could pick up and go home and take Aquitaine with her if she wanted to. She'd already done it once. She could certainly do it again. Uh, so... So uh, it wasn't anything you would do with uh, Eleanor of Aquitaine, and therefore it caused increasing estrangement in addition to the uh, Beckett story and in addition to trouble with the sons who were also now growing up and getting older and, and becoming troublesome, that is, having their own opinion. Um, so there was trouble in the family between father, sons, and wife, and then Rosamond only made things worse. And so by the 70s, uh, Henry and Eleanor were really at war. And she went home to France, to her territory where she was safe, and, and left him. And he realized that he couldn't tolerate that, that he couldn't have her uh, just sort of uh, riding around uh, Aquitaine, independent, uh, running her county, uh, her duchy, maybe as his enemy, and maybe colluding with her sons against him. So he arranged for her to be arrested on the continent and shipped home to England and put in Winchester Castle. So there you have the picture on the screen. This was one of many 
places where she now resided for over 10 years. 